Hello, everybody. I'm Sue Bramford. I'm part of the Editorial Council at Latin American Bureau. And today we're launching The Past is an Imperfect Tense, uh, one of Bernardo Krasinski's books, a, a fascinating book. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to Bernardo to briefly introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Uh, presently, I am a writer. I already wrote uh, half a dozen fiction books. Uh, but I used to be a journalist most of my life. I also worked for the government during Lula's government. And uh, I was a teacher at the university. And uh, when I was retired, when I completed 70 years in Brazil, they used to force you to retire. And then I suddenly began writing fiction, which I never did before. And that's, and this is what I do today. And successfully, one of the books we publish at Latin America Bureau, K, uh, has been on shortlists for awards and, and is selling well. It, it's a remarkable story. Um, but yeah. Tom, uh, you're here, aren't you, Tom? Can you introduce yourself? Okay, so my yeah. name's Tom Gateshouse, and I've been working for Lab for several years now, and uh, I am the translator of The Past is an Imperfect Tense. Fine. Well, we're going to begin uh, with Bernardo reading the very first chapter of the book in Portuguese, and then Tom's going to read the English version. Começo pelo fim, pela carta. Escrevi à mão, cada palavra sou pesada. Despachei a antiga para ser entregue por carteiro que bate a porta como se deve. Registrei para me assegurar da entrega. Todavia sem remetente. Carta para não ser respondida. Não vou repetir por inteiro o que escrevi. Não é coisa bonita de se dizer. Nada de que se orgulhar. Escrevi porque era preciso. Sempre houve o pai que expulsou de casa o filho. Deus o baniu o homem do paraíso e o homem era seu filho. Por ele criado a sua semelhança. E o paraíso era sua morada. Mito fundador, o paraíso para sempre perdido. Expulsou o primeiro pecado. Eu deixei passar pecado sem conta. Levei tempo para chegar à carta. Foram 30 anos de aprendizado. O pai aprendendo do filho. Lições sempre mais penosas. Até que cansado de me alarmar a cada tenir do telefone, Cansado de reaver esperanças para em seguida perdê-las, optei por perder de vez a ele, ainda que filho único. Expulsei por exaustão. I'll start at the end, with the letter. I wrote it by hand, weighing my every word. I sent it the old-fashioned way, postman, a knock at the door, via recorded delivery, to be sure of it reaching the intended recipient. I included no return address. It needed no response. I won't repeat what I wrote in its entirety. They weren't kind things to say, nothing that I'm proud of, but I had no choice. The figure of the father who casts his son from the home has always existed. God banished man from paradise, his home, even though man was his son, created in his own image. The founding myth, paradise forever lost. But while God punished the first sin, I let countless sins go unpunished. It took me a long time to come to the letter. It was a 30 year learning process, father learning from son, with each lesson more painful than the last. Finally, tired of fretting every time the phone rang, tired of getting my hopes up only to see them dashed again and again, I decided to disown him once and for all, my only son. I banished him out of exhaustion. Oh, it, it's a it's a powerful beginning. Bernardo, can you explain a little bit why you decided to write this this book? I know you have um, two sons, of your own adopted sons. Can you talk to us a little bit about the genesis of the book? Well, the book, the story, 
is strongly inspired on the on the real story uh, of my relationship with one of, one of my sons. Uh, I have two adopted sons, uh, uh, so the story is the fact uh, I wrote the story as a in a literary mode. So uh, I have two adopted child, but uh, this, in the story I say I have only one. So I made a sort of a fusion of characters. Uh, I also created one character. I changed circumstances. I changed locations. So as to work the whole thing as a a literary exercise. One could say almost a catharsis, a literary catharsis. So, uh, uh, but uh, most of the events of the story, of the incidents, they happen exactly as they are told in the book. Uh, uh, so it was very sort of a painful writing in a way. Uh, not easy writing because uh, along uh, the main moment, the, the same moment you are writing it, you are recalling events and you are remembering, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's not an easy writing. I mean, I think uh, this one is a much more personal story. Or you're delving deep into your own uh, feelings and you're critical of yourself D during the years you brought up well the two sons or the one son in the story and does this reflect your own feeling that you made mistakes bringing up the, the adopted sons that that it's the writing this book has led you to quite profound self-analysis Yes, well, well, we always made mistakes with, with our ch children, yes, and uh, it's, it's unavoidable. But with, your, uh, with my children, I make mistakes and they're not adopted, but maybe it's harder with adopted children. Yes. Well, the most interesting thing of the whole story of adoption, as I tell in the book, is that we, we, we knew nothing about adoption, we, we just adopted. And uh, it was really quite irresponsible at the time. And, uh, and, but I would say now that it, it, it ended, uh, it had a, a, a happy end, a happy end. Yes, they are already on the 40s. I mean, one of them is 43, the other is 40. And it's, it's ended all right, but uh, it was very difficult extremely difficult. With normal children uh, is already difficult. As a, with adopted children is a little more difficult. Yes. And maybe it's more difficult because your uh, the two boys are mulatto or, or in, in England we call are black and, and I had uh, the son who you discuss in the book he lived for me for, with, he lived with us for several months in London. And I remember very strongly that I took him to do some shopping in Brixton Market. Well, Brixton Market, there's largely black people there. It's an area of London, which is populated by the Caribbeans. And I remember him turning to me as we left and said, oh, I enjoyed that. Uh, I, uh, that was a good experience. And I looked at him and said, well, why? And he said, do you know, this is the first time in my life that I, f I felt at home and I saw black people raising their heads, being proud of, of their race. And I, I've never forgotten that. And he was, what, 13, 14 then. So it made me very aware in a way I've never been aware before of the weight of racism in Brazil. And I think they must have been very aware and you must have learned about how widespread racism is in yes, just in, by bringing them up. Yes, in my case, in the case of this child, he often didn't want to, to go to the market or when we asked him to buy something because he was 
he feared he would be expelled or, 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 or thought to be a, uh, uh, something bad would happen. I mean, he he avoided to go alone to a market. And even when, even when he went with his mother, uh, there were a few incidents, disagreeable incidents, yes. Uh, in Brazil, only now the, 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 the situation is changing. I mean, there is a more awareness of racial discrimination, but it's still a very complicated situation here. I mean, uh, and if you go to a McDonald's, for instance, all the employees are black and all the customers are white, you see? They're very clear. In Brazil, the racial division is also class division. This is the difference uh, as compared to other countries. So discrimination is more of a class nature than of a, a ethnic nature. Bernardo, this one is from chapter 15. 15, yeah. Ao voltar do seu primeiro dia de escola primária, sabia os nomes de todos os meninos e meninas da classe e como era cada um. Descobrira quem mandava e quem era mandado. Mapear os grupinhos e seus pequenos líderes. Sabia em quem podia confiar e de quem deveria se defender. Impressionou-me não só sua fenomenal memória, mas também a capacidade de perceber coerências num coletivo à primeira vista caótico e insondável. Parecia movido por um instinto de alerta quase animal, como se desde muito cedo se sentisse vulnerável no mundo predador. Ele estava com sete anos. Tom? Upon returning from his first day at primary school, he knew the names of all the other boys and girls in his class and what each of them was like. He had discovered who led and who followed. He had sussed out the groups and who was in charge. He knew whom he could trust and from whom he had to defend himself. I was struck not only by his phenomenal memory, but also his ability to perceive the dynamics of a collective after just one chaotic and confusing encounter. He seemed motivated by a warning instinct that was almost animal as if he had felt vulnerable in a predatory world from a very young age. He was seven years old. Where do you think this feeling of vulnerability came from, Bernardo? Well, this is speculation by me. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not sure it is true. I mean, there is a speculative uh, assertion. Uh, but I think it's related to the issue we discussed before. I mean, the feeling of, of uneasiness. I mean, being so different from his parents and and listening here and there to, to some unpleasant phrase. Or, uh, but also I think this episode reflects, and I think this is not written in the book, but. Now, I think it reflects also uh, 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 abilities. I mean, he, he, he really is very sociable, very sociable. He makes friends very easily, very rapidly. And he has a good memory, so I think. But uh, at that time, I attributed this to a sense of vulnerability. <clears throat> I'm not sure of this today, but uh, that was my feeling when I wrote the book, that uh, it was always alert, alert, alert. One of the things that is striking in the book is that the author, you, or the father in, in the book, is very sensitive and very perceptive, but at the same time behaves on some occasion cruelly and violently. Does this reflect, to some degree, your feelings towards your behavior towards your sons? Well, I'm not a, a pai patron, like that Italian film, you see. I'm not a, a German father or a, 
uh, or a strict Italian father. I'm a Jewish father. And, uh, but I think I have some severe moral principles, let's say. You know, so on the moral side of life, I think I am very strict. Uh, but we, me, myself and my wife, we were very, very flexible and relaxed and, and they had a very free education and uh, we didn't beat the children. I mean, almost there is one chapter and then I really let him and I remember that. So I don't see myself as an austere and severe father. I, I remember once being in your house with one of your sons and you were very angry with him. Uh, and he drove me home and, and I said to him, I found that quite upsetting. Are you OK? And he said, oh, yes, I'm used to it. And I know my father loves me very much. And, 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 uh, and I think that doesn't come. Well, I don't know. Maybe, Tom, you, you have a view on this. Does this come across strongly in the book that he that he loves this son, um, although he he rejects him? What did you feel about this, Tom? I think it's a very complex question. I think, uh, you know, yes and no. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's, from the beginning, a strong feeling of, of protectiveness and, and fear in, in the character of the father, especially when, when the boy is very young. Um, but that, yes, also there's, you know, there's real anger expressed by that character in both his words and actions, um, almost to a point that's, I think, shocking for the reader. Well, uh, one may attribute this, this feeling when reading the book to, so to sort of a, I would say, not a literary trick, but a literary resort. I mean, I wanted to dramatize things, you see. This is the other big theme in the book, which is drug addiction. And, and this also comes from a real life experience with your son, I think. Yes, yeah, this was a very painful experience. I, I, I study a lot to be able to write the book. And, uh, and in this sense, it's quite different from K. I I mean, it's, it has also I mean, a, a didactic dimension. I think it's a it's a useful book. It could, it could, could we put in the, in the, in the shelf of the self-help books? You see, <laughs> it's, 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 it was written with this intention. In fact, also intention of being useful was using my experience to help others overcome their difficulties with adopted children or addicted children. You see. Have you any views on why Elias uh, turned to drugs? Was there any point in his life where he he, he was particularly vulnerable or felt rejected? Well, see, mm -hmm. That's that generation, still present generations, they naturally resort to marijuana, to grass, and to and to drinking particular drink, they drink very much beer. And uh, some of them pass through this phase and go along on his life, organize, but a few of them succumb, uh, uh, become addict at, at that very early stage. And, and when this addiction began to disorganize life, then it has no solution. So this is why I think it, it's 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 not good to say that marijuana doesn't make any harm. It would make harm to a few, and uh, but not even if not to the majority. So it's it happens quite by chance, I think. But perhaps in the case of adopted children, uh, the probability is higher because they have 
they live with a feeling of something is lost. I mean, they were rejected for the original mother. I mean, this rejection, this sense of rejection, it's basic in the in the structural uh, in the structure of the personality of adopted child. Even if the adoption uh, develops uh, favorably, I mean, it goes along well, he still will have this sense that my mother rejected me. And, uh, and uh, this in itself alone uh, already opens a sort of a, a flank of vulnerability, you see? Uh, this is why I think uh, in, in adopted children is more frequent to find cases of uh, strong addiction and uh, dif difficulty to get rid of addiction. Yes, Bernardo, very often now, um, the authorities try to maintain contact between the adopted child and the biological mother. Mm. Uh, and um, with hindsight, do you think it might have helped, um, Elias, if you had had maintained some kind of contact uh, with, with the biological mother, who I think you didn't even know, did you? Did you ever meet her or? or? No, no, we had no contact. We don't know who they are. And uh, in our case, Elias, uh, the, 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 the youngest, the one who is in fact the main inspiration of the book. He probably wanted to know, but he now says it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And the oldest one never wanted to know. Uh, Tom, you, you uh, were the translator of the book. How did you find, uh, what kind of book was it to translate? Did it present particular problems? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a short book, but all the same, uh, in some ways, quite, quite difficult to translate um, with, I think, certain specific problems. Uh, for example, I mean, some of the language to do with race and racism. I mean, that's always very difficult to render into into English from other languages um, and particularly Brazilian Portuguese, I think, because of the you know Brazilian culture and the history of of um you know immigration and kind of racial mixing and so on has its own kind of very unique vocabulary of um referring to race uh, so you know that was a challenge um but yes also i think you know it, expressing some of the the feelings of the father because they're so um you know it, it's so sort of hard hitting in Portuguese and so you know the challenge is exactly how to maintain that effect in English. Uh, uh, Tom is there anything you'd like to ask Bernardo? Yeah there is one question in particular so um, I only found out recently that uh, Bernardo that you have uh, two sons um, so all the way through when I was translating this uh, I thought that the character was your only child um wholly based on this person um so it was a, a surprise to me when i found out that you you have a second son um and at the beginning of this interview you mentioned that actually the character's kind of a slight fusion of the two sons um so i'd be interested to hear you talk a bit more about that it's very funny because in fact i don't see it as a fusion i use the expression but the other son he thinks it is a fusion. So, uh, uh, it, 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 the reason for this could be jealousy. I mean, he he, he wouldn't he wouldn't accept that I wrote a book based on only on one of them. You see, but perhaps unconsciously, I also put in the story uh, some elements that belong to the other boy, you know, the, the, the youngest one, I don't know, you see. I mean, that, that brings me on to another thing I wanted to ask, which was, um, why now? I mean, presumably this, uh, most of the action of this book happened a long time ago, 
So why, after all this time, have you decided to write about it? I don't really know why now, but uh, I think it was only possible after the, the boy, which was a drug addict, uh, overcome his addiction and, and, and uh, was able to settle in, into a normal life. I think at that moment, perhaps, only at that moment, I was able to write about it, not before. Thank you very much, Bernardo. And, and um, thank you, Tom.